bless you. Good morning. Can we start with a, a moment of silence? All right. Welcome to the annual Abigail Rebecca Cohen Art Lecture. Um, Abby Cohen was a beloved friend, sister, daughter, and classmate who graduated from GFS in 1991. Her life as an artist and photographer was dedicated to the pursuit of social and aesthetic concerns. The purpose of this annual lecture series is to honor both Abby's passion for photographic art and for GFS, as well as to inspire a love of the arts in future GFS students. It is made possible by the generous support of her brother, Jonathan Cohen, class of 1988, and his wife, Julia Pershan. Uh, we are so fortunate here at GFS to welcome artists into our school each year through the Cohen Lecture. Um, to share with us the important and transformative perspective um, of people who've dedicated their life to creating. Um, while this lecture benefits our whole community, um, I hope that, and I invite you students especially, um, to cherish the opportunity of the next 40 minutes when the outside art world is brought to you. And, um, we hope in the art department, just as the Cohen family does, um, that this lecture inspires your love for art. Uh, this year, we welcome Philadelphia photographer Ron Tarver, and I'll pass the microphone to Michael Williamson to introduce him. Thank you. Good morning. Ron Tarver received his BA in Journalism and Graphic Arts from Northeastern State University in Oklahoma and has been a staff photographer at the Philadelphia Inquirer since 1983. In addition to his newspaper publications, his work has appeared in National Geographic, Life, Time, Newsweek, Sports Illustrated, and Black and White Magazine. He is co-author of the book, We Were There, Voices of African American Veterans, published by HarperCollins in 2004, which was accompanied by a traveling exhibition that debuted at the National Constitution Center here in Philadelphia. He shares the, 19, uh, the 2012 Pulitzer Prize at the Philadelphia to inquire for his work on a series of d uh, documenting school violence in the Philadelphia public school system, and this year has been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize for a series exploring a prison program which allows inmates to train dogs otherwise destined to be put down. In addition to a successful career in photojournalism, Tarver has distinguished himself in the field of fine art photography. A recipient of the prestigious Pew Fellowship in the Arts, he has also received grants from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, and an Independence Foundation Fellowship. Ron Tarver, along with art historian Jennifer Zaro, participated in the curation of an exhibit at the uh, Woodmere Gallery, A Million Faces, the photography of John Mosley. Some of you may have seen that. Ron is an instructor of studio art photography at Swarthmore College. Tarver's work has been exhibited nationally and internationally in over 30 solo and 50 group exhibitions and has included many private, corporate, and museum collections, including the Philadelphia Museum of Art, State Museum of Pennsylvania and Harrisburg, Oklahoma Museum of History, and the National Museum of American Art of the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C. His work is represented by Robin Rice. Gallery in New York, Soho Myriad in Atlanta, Georgia, and Grand Image in Seattle, Washington. Ron is my friend, and Ron is the parent of Riley, Wes, Michaela, and the um, husband of Kristen, and they reside in Elkins Park. Please welcome Ron Tarver. Hello, GFS. Um, uh, I'm really honored to be here. Um, 
And uh, I don't know if any of you know Riley or Michaela or Wes, they, they had friends at GFS and so we had a lot of GFSers in and out of the house. I think I had a few that interned with me a couple of times. We had some interesting incidents with that that we won't discuss right now. But uh, so I have a really long, uh, you know, compassionate uh, relation, an intimate relationship with GFS. Um, I want to thank uh, Hannah, uh, Megan, and Michael, and also Michael up in the booth for uh, making all this work, all the technology here. Um, so I'm only going to take a couple hours. Just, just joking. I know, I know, it's a bad joke. But uh, so I'm only going to take about 40 minutes to go through this because I know lunch is afterwards, and I know everybody gets a little. I'm, I haven't had coffee or anything, so I'm a little jittery. So you just got to bear with me. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is my 30 years, illustrious years of just bumbling my way through art, and uh, and I think that that is probably the best advice I can give anybody is to sort of, you know, let the art do what the art does. I mean, you bring, you, you bring yourself to the art and the art's gonna bring yourself to you and, and things are gonna happen, magical things will happen. Uh, but I'm gonna show you some examples of some of the things that I've done, some of the mistakes I've made and how I've learned from those mistakes. Um, uh, not necessarily mistakes, sometimes serendipity plays a big role in it. You know, you think you're starting out with one thing, it sort of evolves as, into something else. Um, and uh, the class, uh, I just uh, developed a class at Swarthmore this year, it's the first semester, it's, it's called Alternative Processes. And uh, uh, the, they gave me fr pretty much free reign to develop the classes I wanted. Uh, traditionally, alternative uh, processes involves 19th century processes like sanotypes and Van Dyck's and platinum palladium, those kind of things. But I wanted to sort of expand the class and make it tricky in terms of uh, building things and actually building things and then photographing those things. So I'll show you some example of, of, uh, of what we're doing in that class and, and what the students are doing. Um, so let's get into this. So uh, how do you avoid making mistakes, okay? Uh, my sage wisdom on this is never do anything. <laughs> if you stay in a dark room and uh, breathe lightly, you'll be fine. Um, how do you make mis avoid making mistakes in art? Never make anything. Then you'll be safe. You don't have to worry about it. Making art is a risky process. Um, you know, you really kind of put yourself out there when you do. You're, it's almost as if you're sort of exposing your soul when you, when you put something on the wall or you, you do an installation or whatever. You're really sort of exposing the inner part of you, and it's a risky thing. You know, it can be a very risky thing. Um, one of my favorite examples of that is uh, Lee Miller, Man Ray, and a Mouse. Um, have you ever? Anybody heard, have you heard of Man Ray before? Uh, he was a you know, pretty big photographer back in the 20s and 30s, very, played a very significant role in the, uh, in the Dada movement and the uh, Surrealist movement. Uh, he, uh, uh, Lee Miller, who also was a, became a pretty famous artist, uh, she was one of the first, she was a uh, successful fashion model in the 20s and then went to uh, 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 assist uh, Man Ray, I think from 1929 to 1932. Uh, but during that time, she developed film for him, processed some of his prints. He was pretty much doing straight photography until she was in the darkroom one day and a mouse ran across her foot. And what happened was, you know, if we're in a dark room and a mouse runs across the foot, you're going to switch the light on. So she flipped, flipped the light on in the process of, in the, in, in the space of when she was developing a negative. And she realized the negative was in the tray, flipped the, the light off. But what happened was that brief little encounter with the light made the negative change. It changed the tonal ratio of, of, uh, of uh, what it would normally be. It had a lot more contrast. But what it inadvertently did was started a movement in photography that continues to today. Uh, you've probably heard of solarization. Uh, it's uh, where, like I said, the tones shift. This is a very famous picture by Man Ray. Um, that, that I think one of the best demonstrations of, of how that works. Uh, this is another picture of Lee Miller. 
that he made um, to you know, give you an idea about how it works. And if we push the solarization button on Photoshop, you get a solarized mouse. So all the things that we work with in Photoshop, all the terminology, all of the, uh, the buttons, the sliders, the gizmos, the whiz bangs on Photoshop has a direct reference going back to traditional processes, especially darkroom processes. Um, I'm going to give you a few ideas about, or a few examples of what I've done in the past to, uh, that, that ended up working out but wasn't my original intention. Um, so we've all been to the Wissahickon, I, I would imagine, or most of us, we know about the Wissahickon. Uh, I'm from Oklahoma, I've been out here now probably longer than I've been anywhere, but uh, uh, when I first moved here, I would go to the Wissahickon, and it was just this magical place. I mean, it was, you know, this, you know, the creek and the streams, and it was just wonderful. And at that time, uh, I was, uh, I was a uh, pretty big devotee to Ansel Adams. Uh, and if you know of Ansel Adams' work, I mean, I think if you walk down the street and say, name a photographer, people say Ansel Adams, you know. In, in fact, his name has almost become a cliche. Um, but he was also an amazing photographer, and he taught me a lot about black and white photography, um, so much so to the extent that I went out and I bought that camera, the, not that camera, but a camera just like it, 4x5, a uh, little field camera, um, and I wanted to shoot pictures in the Wissahickon uh, like Ansel Adams did. So I went down, started making some pictures, and then I got the idea, I said, you know, I'm going to sell this. This is when I was working at the Inquirer. This was in 1996. Uh, I got the idea, I said, you know what? We, they've never run a, a, a anything like what I want to do, what I want to present at, in the Inquirer magazine at the time. So I went to Bert Fox and uh, told Bert, uh, you know, pitch this idea that Bert, you know, who lives in Jersey, so he hadn't, he hadn't really been to the Wissahickon. So I'm pitching him this idea saying, Bert, you know, we have this amazing park in Philadelphia. You know, it's got these grand vistas, you know, like, like uh, Snake River and Grand Tetons, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's got this beautiful, you know, in the, in the, you know, in peaks and valleys and blah, 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 and he's getting really excited. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it's got waterfalls, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's got even, you know, El Capitan, it's got that, you know, and I'm getting completely out of it. You know, so he's like, yeah, you know, we need to do that. I said, yeah, Burton, I want to shoot a four by five. I want to take my tripod with a hood and just do my Ansel Adams thing down there. And he said, yeah, well, let's do it. Let's do it. And so I go down, and that's what I found, you know, a rock in a stream. That's about as close as I got to El Capitan. <laughs> but one of the things I realized is that the Wissahickon is basically a big ditch. <laughs> It's a beautiful ditch, and it's a long ditch, and it's a really big ditch, but basically it's a big gorge, it's a big valley. Um, and every shot, every, when I try to get these grand vistas and things like that, I always got that crevasse, I always got that, that you know, crevasse, that, that big V in the, in the photograph. And it was very difficult not to get away from that. Uh, and I tried and I tried, I shot for weeks and weeks and weeks uh, with the 4x5, making these images. Um, and then it came to me, I said, you know, the Wissahickon is not, is, it doesn't exist on that big scale. It doesn't exist on that grand, you know, uh, Yosemite and, and Teton scale. It exists, exists in this little intimate space. And when you go down there, I think, you know, those of you that have been down there, you sort of, you sort of relate to it on that scale. You relate to it on just the intimate parts of it, the little, you know, the, the, the you know, devil's pool and, you know, all the, you know, the, the finger span bridge, all those things, you sort of relate to it on that scale. And so then I thought, well, you know, I need to shift my perspective on this whole thing. And I started making pictures like this that are, <laughs> that sort of convey the idea of this grandeur, but actually that image is probably exists in, it's just a little water trick trickle out of a, out of a, out of a rock uh, that's probably about maybe a 10 by 12 inch square. Um, but it sort of conveys the idea of that big idea of the waterfall and things like that. So once I sort of shifted my perspective on how I wanted to present this park, uh, and then I started bringing images back. Um, I think the magazine grabbed onto the idea. So they let me go for a, a year, uh, roughly, to uh, go down and, and shoot the park in the four seasons. So, so other things kind of happened along the way uh, that um, we were actually, we were, the magazine had planned to do this big 
uh, I wouldn't say an expose, but a big uh, look at Hillary Clinton. And uh, something fell through on that. So when you work for a magazine and a newspaper, they have to order their pages in advance. So they had a lot of pages and nothing really to put in it. And then they said, oh, we got Ron's thing. So that's how I got a year to shoot down there because they needed a lot of stuff to go on this, this, this big order of pages for that magazine. And it was, they had planned this out about a year down the road, so actually it was a little bit shorter than a year. But, uh, but it gave me a lot of space and a lot of time to, to, to work on these images. So, so, you know, I started doing things like this, you know, doing, uh, um, playing with light down there at all times of the day, uh, shooting the creeks. Um, this was the uh, cover for Spring, uh, 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 Fern Prawn. Um, got a lot of email. I know it's an invasive, so just get over it. But this is a, a Devil's Walking Stick. We got so many, you know, like, you do all these pictures and everybody, the first thing we got in the mail is, that's an invasive. I'm like, I know. But, you know, but it, it did that and I had to take a picture of it, so. Uh, reflection. Uh, so yeah, so it was great. It was a really great time to just be down there and just experience all these things. Um, this picture became the cover of the magazine. Uh, the next idea I had was to do a story on bridges. And there was a Japanese film crew, I just kind of ran across this by accident, a few years after, a couple of years after the Wishicken story ran. Um, and I sort of sold them on the idea that large format photography could work in the magazine. Uh, uh, I found this Japanese film crew that was over filming the bridges of Philadelphia. And they were filming it during a time when it was the 300th anniversary of the Frankfurt Avenue Bridge. And uh, I thought, well, you know, we should do that story, you know? I mean, we, you know, we live here, we should do that story. So I, so I pitched the idea to photograph the uh, bridges in, in town, and, the, and they, they uh, went for the idea. So I went out and I started making pictures like this. This is Columbia, uh, Columbia Avenue Bridge that runs along um, in between um, uh, Martin Luther King and Kelly Drive. Um, and you know, I was making prints, I'd done my assignment, I'd make, made all the negatives, for, nice four by five negatives. And uh, the phone rang, I was in the dark room and something happened, the phone rang and I went to answer it, the paper was exposing and I got back and I said, oh no, I completely forgot about this. So stuck it in the uh, developer. And I'd put the paper in the enlarger upside down. So what happened was I got this which is the same picture, but it gave it this more uh, pictorialist kind of look. And I was, and this is another time when I was really in the, sort of this, the, the idea of the pictorialist movement, which uh, happened back in the, uh, in the, in the uh, ni uh, early 1800s, or late 1800s, uh, where photography was trying to compete with painting. There was a big, argument about photography just being a, a, a mere copying device. So photographers started to go out and they started to do things to their prints and make them more like paintings. So when I've, this wasn't exactly what I got at first, but it, it was the seeds to the idea that got me to, to this, to this um, technique, I guess, of printing on, a, on the reverse side of the paper. Um, and like I said, you know, the pictorialist, this is a, a picture from Alvin Langdon Cohen, uh, uh, Coburn, who was a, a big, uh, one of the uh, noted pictorialist photographers in the, in the 1800s. 1800s. Um, so I started playing around with that idea, and uh, this is the uh, Henry Avenue Bridge. But that one mistake, that one, you know, just by turning the paper upside down one time, literally took me through about four or five different series of works. Uh, from the bridges, this is another um, shot of the uh, uh, Strawberry Mansion Bridge, Falls Bridge. This is Betsy Ross, and don't ask me how I got there. So it was tricky with the big camera and just trying to figure out how to stand on that beam. Um, but uh, so when we took me through there, I did a series in uh, Havana um, that I was 
really lucky to get. Uh, one of my collectors, uh, I was with a gallery in town called the Sandy Webster Gallery, wanted to go to Phil I wanted uh, a uh, photographer to go to, to uh, Cuba and sort of document, you know, Cuba. This is back 2000, two, uh, 1999, 2000. And, uh, and Sandy said, well, you know, well, I'll hook you up and you guys can talk. You can figure out how you want to do this. And so I went to his house, had a meeting, and uh, he said, oh, yeah, I think somebody should go down and, you know, photograph the, you know, the old lady smoking cigars with the colorful hats and all the colorful cars and the colorful buildings, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, I don't really do black and white. I said, how about if I go down? I mean, I really, I don't really do color. I said, but how if I go down and I'll shoot it in black and white and I'll shoot it at night and I won't have any pictures in it? How about that? And he said, uh, okay. He went for it. So he paid for uh, my wife and I to go down. We spent a month down there making these images. But uh, when I got back, I wanted to, to sort of give it this, you know, more of a dream-like effect because at that time, Cuba wasn't as in the news as it is now. And I wanted to make it, to give the images this romantic feeling, uh, sort of a sentimental, nostalgic feeling. And uh, so I uh, did everything, again, reversing the paper upside down. So those are, these are a few images from that. Um, also wanted to do a series at, uh, on uh, Philadelphia and some of the places you normally wouldn't see in Philadelphia. This is in North Philly. Uh, it's called, uh, I call this Mr. Pabone's Garden. And it was actually in a, a man's house, um, Mr. Pabone. Uh, that let me, uh, I, I was driving by there one night and I saw this whole scene and I said, do you mind if I uh, come back and photograph your garden? And he said, sure. And then we had some friends, they were out drinking beer in the corner and everything. And uh, I came back and I set my camera up and these exposures are really long. I mean, this was a 45 minute exposure. And uh, I set my camera up and I hit the button and I'm standing there and I think after about 15 minutes he looks over and he says, what are you doing? I'm like, well, you know, this is a long exposure and, you know, I don't know, I don't know I really don't know what I'm doing because I don't know how long this is going to last because there's no way to make uh, a calculation of your exposure when you're doing 45 minute, uh, you know, expo or exposing film for 45 minutes. So and it was just a rough guess based on some other things that I'd done. And so I made the image, and luckily the negative turned out, and I, I made the print, and I took it back to him, and he was, you know, very happy with it and everything, so he has a print of that. Uh, this is another shot from the, uh, uh, the Cuba series of a triptych uh, corner building, uh, corner of a building in Havana. Uh, did a series on trees using the same thing. This is on Ridge Avenue. Um, this is another uh, tree garden in Oklahoma. So, you know, that, that one mistake sort of carried me through a lot of different, different ideas. And the one thing that I've found is I've tried to duplicate this same thing in Photoshop and I just can't quite get the same effect. So, you know, there's some, something to be said about the darkroom still, that there's sometimes you just can't get the same effect in Photoshop. I know, you know, you, can, you, you think that Photoshop can do wonders and then it can, it can do imagine, amazing things, but there's, I still, I'm a firm believer that there's some things that you still can't get to in Photoshop that you can get to in the darkroom. So that's my little spill on, uh, on uh, take on the darkroom. Um, so the world in the grain of sand. So I took my kids down to the, this is when they were little. We went down to the, uh, to the beach and we collected shells like everybody does. And we, we brought them back. We took them to my studio. And I said, well, let's scan them. Let's just see what happens. So we put them, plopped them on the scanner. I put some cellophane down on the scanner. And we got this. And I was looking at it. And I don't know if you can see it now very clearly or not, but if you look, and I don't have a pointer to show you, but it, you can see the two shells on the, on the left there. They look sort of like, you, they look like galaxies, and there, some sand fell out around them, and it looked like stars. And I thought, wow, you know, that, that's, that's a really cool idea, you know, a really cool effect. So I went back uh, when, uh, this is during, uh, later on during the winter, I went back and I sat down at the scanner, I started playing with this idea, and uh, took the same shells and arranged them, and uh, rearranged them, and, uh, and, and I got this effect, and I thought, well, you know, if I can get that, then I can do other things where I can have, uh, I don't know if you can see that very well, but it's a, um, it's a, it's a, it, it's, it, it's made to symbol, uh, to resemble a, uh, uh, a, a dying star. So basically what it is, it's, it's a brown egg that's been submerged in olive oil. And yeah, so I put olive oil, don't do this, 
don't do this. I mean, I tell my students, I, you know, I tell them what I do and I say, don't do it because, you know, I had to really make sure that the olive oil didn't leak on my scanner. So, but I found a nice little box with a glass bottom and cocked it up really well and, and, uh, and then sort of built this thing. So this whole thing is like this construction. Um, this is a picture of a black piece of paper where I, I, I took a, a hole puncher, punched it in, and then lifted the flap of it up a little bit, and then shined a light from the top, and it gave the effect of uh, sort of an eclipse. Um, this is actually the Hubble's view of Uranus. Um, and I saw this online, and you know, when I started, actually when I started working on these things, I started looking at uh, uh, how the Hubble saw things. And I used the scanner in the same way, and I just thought, well, yeah, I'm gonna use the scanner as, it, as if it's my telescope. And so, when the Hubble takes a picture of something, it's not as if, you know, it takes a snapshot and spits out a picture. It's, it's a rendering down of data that's, pulled from the telescope. And it takes some time for those things to happen. So when I uh, started working on these images, I sort of saw myself in the same role as, you know, I'm in, sitting in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and things are rendering down and I never knew what, I'm get, um, what I was gonna get. Um, you know, and I'd build these little constructions on my scanner and do things. And my rule to myself was that if it doesn't work the first time, I wouldn't fix it in Photoshop. I would go back and try and readjust it and make it work how many ever times it took. But it was, the idea was not to, uh, to use Photoshop in any, any, of these, any of these pictures. So this is the Hubble uh, view of Uranus. This is my view of it, <laughs> which again is a, is a white egg submerged in olive oil. Um, this is a picture of uh, a little berry my son actually saw on the street and uh, it, it was raining and I, we saw this berry and it was, it was going towards the, towards the gutter and I said, go get the berry quick, you know, and he goes out and he grabs the berry and so we saved the berry. But um, it, it uh, sort of reminded me of a little bit of some, you know, some planet, who knows, maybe could be Mars or whatever, but you know, some red planet with speckles on it. Um, this is, uh, actually this is a plate that I put on the scanner and uh, scanned and it sort of gave sort of this, you know, you know, eclipse, eclipse effect. Um, this is a photo of a black egg, an uh, egg that I painted black and put it on the scanner. And there's a lot of little details that you really can't see in there. Um, is, is there any way to bring the lights down or is that possible or? The what? Oh. I don't know. Yeah, there it goes. Yeah, okay. So let's go back. Oh, you can see that one better now, right? Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So that's the egg. That's the berry. That's the plate. That's, yeah. So, anyway, so that's a black egg. And, you know, when, when, I, um, <clears throat> when I did that, I put it on some plastic, and it got that little wisp up on the upper right hand corner which is purely ac pure accident you know I just oh and actually this little thing here I don't know if you can see this see that little glow down there in the prints you can really see them of course you can see them better in the prints but that, that, that little glow at the bottom was also a little specular highlight that just came it just happened I, I couldn't have planned some of these things um, but yeah that little wisp there was uh, that little wisp was something that just happened. And, and also, you know, painting the egg, and then I figured that I could do some other things with the olive oil, like I could put, add, add in other ingredients to the olive oil to sort of give you that sort of the viscosity of space. You know, like when you're looking at image of, images in space, you're looking through, you know, billions and billions of miles of time and space. So you're not actually looking at that object, you're looking at where that object was like 10,000 years ago. So there's a lot of optical things that happen when you look at celestial objects and I wanted to try and replicate that on my scanner. Um, this is a blueberry. And uh, you know, when, when you're working with a scanner, you have to think that you're, it's kind of like Michelangelo, you're looking from the bottom up. So everything that I did, I had to d figure out how can I get the light to this thing uh, 
you know, it's not as if I could just shine a light from the top. I'd have to figure out how to reflect the light underneath it to, to, get, to give it these effects. So I built all these little systems of mirrors and, oh God, this is exhausting just thinking about it. But uh, foil and all kinds of things where I would hit the light back and it would reflect underneath the thing, you know, and I would, it, it would just, I mean, there, it's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> That's all I can say. But uh, a blueberry, this is a... Um, a uh, sycamore seed, you know, and again it had that little wispy thing going up that was just something un completely unpredictable. I, um, this has, on all the little dots you see in there, that's grains of sand, which is where you know, the William Blake poem comes from. Um, and I, I ripped that idea, the name from William Blake, um, which is, you know, what they say is, you know, good artists borrow, great artists steal, so keep that in mind. Um, so this is little grains of sand in there. And uh, I sat down one day, and this, this picture, when I exhibited it, was about four feet big. And I thought, uh, well, I'll just sit down and I'll clean. The one thing I did do is clean up all the little dust specks and things like that. So I sat down and I, I started cleaning up all the little dust specks in between the grains of sand. About 10 hours later, I was still cleaning you know, dust specks from this. So this picture was super labor intensive just to make it sort of work. Um, the Woodburn Art Museum displayed the images <laughs> in their uh, third triennial of photography, so you can kind of get a size of the scale of them. They, you know, they were, they were fairly big. Um, I did this image, it was called uh, Grand Nebula. And um, it was a, I had made some, I cracked an egg actually that I didn't show you, but I cracked an egg on a piece of glass and uh, I set it aside in my studio and uh, the egg dried up, the egg white dried up. So I thought, huh, you know, I'll take that and I'll do some samples of it. So I started sampling little bits and pieces of the dried egg white and I found this part which was only maybe about an inch big. Uh, and then resampled it, resampled it, and got it, resed it up so it could, I could make a bigger print with it. But it, it, it made this image. And uh, you know, one of, the, one of my highest, one of the things that I considered my highest pride, uh, that I'm most proud of, is that uh, in, 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 in the grand, you know, magical realm of the internet, uh, and how it curates things, you know, because when you hit the button and you Google something, it, you get Google's curation of whatever you're searching for. Uh, it popped up in nebulas of the Hubble Space, Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> so that's it right there on the edge. I have no idea what the cat is. I haven't figured out that. But um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm officially a Hubble Space Telescope image, <laughs> even though, you know, it's really a piece of egg. Um, I, I tell you this, I got so into this project that I called, uh, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a, one of the, 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 one of the uh, people, the designers of, of uh, the uh, Hubble telescope, his name's Mario Levio, and I heard him on NPR one day, and he had just done a book on art and science, and I literally, I called him up, I said, Mario, you got to see what I'm doing here, this is great stuff, you know, and he's like, who are you? And I said, you know, you know, and so he actually, he sent his son up, and we had this really long discussion, and his son came up, who, his son's a photographer actually, and he took some pictures and he went back, and you know, so someplace, Mario Levio has some of my images in his office at the JPL. That's enough for me, thank you. I dropped the mic, I'll leave. But he was really great. Um, what I'm working on now is, um, uh, so when I was growing up, there was this box of photos that used to be in my, the, the, uh, this little bureau in, in, in our living room. A box of, all, you know, I'm sure we all have these things, these old box of photos that my dad took. My dad was a photographer uh, for a while. And uh, he, um, and actually this is a picture of him. This is a picture of my mom, my, my brother. This is taken back in the 50s. This is a self-portrait. Um, that he made of, of, of them. I wasn't born. I came really late in my family's life. And yes, I was not planned, so don't ask me. But, and I actually asked my mom that one time. I got, you know, so I built up my, uh, you know, it's like when I was 14 or something, I walked, she was in the kitchen. I, mom, you know, something I always want to ask you. I said, was I a mistake? And she said, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, Thanks for letting me down. 
um, but no, but so they took me and they raised me as if I was one of their own, so <laughs> everything worked out. But, uh, but there's this big gap in between my brother and I. Uh, my folks were married for 60 years. This is a picture of them that I made of them uh, uh, a little bit uh, before they passed away. Um, but uh, my brother was in the army. He was in the, World War, uh, the Korean army. Uh, Korean War and uh, bought my dad back a bunch of uh, cameras and enlargers and things like that that he got in Germany. My dad really got into photography and started making images. And uh, when I was growing up, my job, I, he never really talked about the photography. I knew it was there because the darkroom was there. He wasn't really involved in photography when I, was, when I was growing up. But the one thing that I got to do was wash all of his negatives every year. So he would have just dozens of rolls of negatives that were tacked up on the side of his, his um, you know, his, his uh, uh, dark room. And I would take them down, put them in the, in, the, in the bathtub, wash them really good, and then give them back to him. He would tack them up. They would get full of dust. The next year, I would take them, put them in the bathtub. This went on forever and ever. So for their 60th anniversary, I took all the negatives. I cut them all up cross-referenced everything, made contact sheets, and I presented it to them for, or to him for his 60th for their 60th wedding anniversary. And he said, what'd you do that for? And I was like, well, I said, I did it because, I didn't say this to him, but I said, I did it because I knew at some point you're not going to be around and I don't know where everything is. So I inherited all those negatives and this bo box of photos. Uh, just last year, and I've always wondered, like, how, I always wanted to have sort of this conversation with, with my dad about his, about his work, uh, but I never could figure out how to do that. So uh, last year I thought, it came to me that, well, maybe what I should do is show my hand in his work some way. So I took images like this. This is a picture of one of the pictures that, were, that was in that box. Uh, first thing I had to do was I had to clean it up because, it, you know, it was, it was really, you know, pretty messed up, stained and everything. I took it to my studio and I started making uh, pictures with it. So what I, the way that I could figure that I could put my hand in these things was to use a knife and to actually, not actually cut the image, I would scan the image, but then I would cut out the image and build sets and things that involved his photos, but also sort of brought it up to uh, ideas that we deal with in current times. So um, I call this, this is uh, the Homesteaders on the Moon. So I took uh, some of my images actually, these are some of the images from the uh, previous series I showed you, and, uh, and made a whole landscape of, uh, of the moon. And I put these people in it. And this is, uh, the way that I see this, this responds to a lot of things at, in current times with immigration and, you know, blacks and, and, uh, and, and, and black migration in Oklahoma, and it sort of touches on a lot of different, different areas. But uh, this is my response to that. It, the, the, uh, pr the picture is actually seven feet long and about 20 feet, or 20 inches, 24 inches high, so it's this gigantic thing. Um, there was this another man that I saw, uh, his, his, his name's Frank, and I had my cousin come down one time. She identified a lot of these images, and uh, I was sitting with her son, who's actually my age. There's a lot of generation skipping in my family, but I was sitting with him, and we pulled that picture out, and he said, uh, he said man, it looks like he's running from something. So I thought, wow, that gives me a great idea. So I made this image where he's actually in the spotlight, maybe from a helicopter, who knows. But uh, I wanted to give that idea of, you know, especially at that time, because back in that time and before, they were dealing with Jim Crow laws and all sorts of other issues. And I wanted to sort of highlight the idea of how blacks were sort of in the spotlight, uh, especially in Oklahoma. Um, he had this picture of this family. Uh, you know, your typical nuclear family, the mother, father, the girl, the car, the nice car and everything. One thing that's generally n wasn't definitely not seen at that time uh, was uh, how this family, uh, that this family existed. You know, I mean, sort of nostalgia and has been sort of er erased from the black community dealing with that sort of time. I mean, we, there, I could go into this forever, but uh, I wanted to sort of highlight the idea about how invisible this family was. So I made this image. So I, I, uh, I uh, uh, printed it out on transparency paper and actually folded it up, and uh, which let the car lay down. But I wanted to highlight the family, uh, how invisible this family was. Um, there was this image, you know, the strong black woman, another image that 
wasn't necessarily, um, it, it was sort of characterized or cartoonized, I, I guess, in, 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 you know, back in the, in the 20s, 30s, 40s. But you didn't really see that image of the strong black woman, so I wanted to make her stand out and, and uh, you know, and, and emphasize just the role that these, 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 you know, the women played in my life and also in, in, in black society. Um, I don't know why he put Hello Darling up there. This is my dad. So uh, there's also this image. And I have no idea why these people, why he shot it this way, why they're, they shot it with, the back to, with their back to the camera. Uh, and there's really no evidence. I mean, I've scanned this picture. I've blown it up. I've looked at it. There's really no evidence of if they're at a funeral, if they're at some memorial service. You can't see any, any grave markers or anything like that in front of them. I don't know what the, so I'll just let my, my, uh, my uh, imagine run wild with that. So, and actually I'm gonna help, I'm gonna ask your help in this because I'm still working on this picture and I'm not sure, I'm not sure where it's going, but there's several iterations of this. This was the first iteration of it. This was the second, and this was the third. So, with hand claps, I want you to help me pick, pick it doesn't necessarily mean this is going to be one, but just give me an idea if I'm heading in the right direction or not. So, how about this one? Okay. Really? Okay. Oh, good! All right! Great. Right. All right. So I'm headed in the right direction. Okay, good. That's all. So I, I have a friend in New York that that, I, that we sort of go back and forth about images, and he and he was like, I don't know if I like that one. I'm like, what? I've been working on this thing for a year, you know. And so he's like, I don't know about the reflection side. I don't know. Who knows where it's going to go? But I'll make another one. Uh, this is another one that I made of this woman in a, in, in a dirt road, and we I worked with a friend of mine who's a performance artist, and we did a whole performance around this picture. Uh, I have no idea why my dad put this you know, very attractive woman in a white dress in the middle of a dirt road. So I made that of her in a bigger dirt road in the middle of a bigger no place. So, uh, so um, I teach a class at Swarthmore, as I said before, uh, called um, Alternative Processes. And like I said, that, you know, they gave me free reign to do what I wanted to do with this class. Um, and if you can read that, it says, during this class, uh, experimentation will be encouraged and uh, what is that? Failure may be, uh, I can't even, sometimes uh, rewarded. Thank you. Okay, reward, okay. Uh, so I'm going to run through this real quick. This is some of my students' work. Uh, this is the, um, the uh, lab that we have at Swarthmore. This is some of their work. Just run through some of this. These are Van Dyke's and Sinotypes that we're working on. So this is one iteration. This is the second iteration of uh, uh, Sophia's work. Santa type, Van Dyke. And this is uh, 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 one of my students took her, uh, took her uh, picture and used it for a party for her, for her boyfriend. Um, and these are a little hard to explain. I won't, probably won't be able to get into it. I can ask you. But I asked them to build things, build a box. Their, their, the task was to build, build a, uh, a box that was uh, uh, 10, by, 10 by 12 inch with 3 inch depth. And they had to use three f uh, photographs and, and, uh, f and uh, f uh, five photographs and three found objects and build a composition. But the idea wasn't what they built. It was how they photographed it. So that was what uh, Noah built. And this was his, uh, he made a, a concert post. Um, DT had built a, this composition to uh, look back at her family, and this was her uh, what the composition was. And uh, uh, Z, uh, uh, Aziz built this composition to make a comment on uh, on uh, African Americans' role over history. So that's it. Thank you.
ideas. I was running that late. 